uh, for this session. Um, so um, I, I live in Munich. It's in Germany. It's just the other side of the Alps. Uh, I live. Um, I, I work at a company called One on One, uh, and I'm doing Android quite a lot. Uh, today I'm going to speak to you about uh, thanks about Gradle mostly. So uh, basically, the material for this talk was just a long list of Gradle tips and tricks that I had. Uh, so. Um, I believe that even if you're very experienced with Gradle, which I hope many of you guys are, uh, you will find at least a couple of slides today that will um, make a difference and, and help you speed up um, your Gradle processes. Um, so basically, I really think that Gradle is an awesome build tool. Of course, there are alternatives like Buck, uh, Bazel. I don't know, um, any of you guys using Buck for builds? Anybody using Bazel? Anybody still doing ant builds? All right, so, so I guess most of you guys are using Gradle. Um, and I think what's really nice about Gradle is that Gradle keeps evolving at a very fast pace. Uh, and performance is also pretty important to, to Gradle. So I don't know if you have been to yesterday's talk about Gradle 3.0. Uh, so Gradle is actually a, a feature. Uh, I mean, performance is actually a feature for Gradle. Um, and this is the direction that, that the guys are going. Uh, so let's just do a really short recap of what happened since the uh, last major release of Gradle 3.0, which happened, um, I believe, last summer. Uh, so with Gradle 3.0, there, of course, were lots of improvements. And one of them was the faster Gradle daemon, uh, which was enabled by default. Um, there's also the latest stable version of Android Gradle plugin, which I uh, really like because they introduced a feature called uh, Build Cache. Uh, which really speeds up even your clean builds because it can cache some of the outputs of the tasks. Um, there's also, of course, the uh, Gradle script Kotlin project, uh, which will allow us to switch to Kotlin, like replace Groovy with Kotlin for writing builds. So you see there's a lot of really exciting stuff coming in. Um, and I think that we, as Gradle users, as uh, software engineers, uh, we really have to uh, try to keep up with the pace uh, and try to learn more about Gradle and just leverage all that, um, uh, all this, um, all those features and all the performance gains that that uh, the Gradle team gives us. Um, so basically, in this session, there will be like two chapters. Uh, first of all, of course, we will speak about optimizing Gradle builds, and second, we will explore some uh, things that will uh, that can make us more productive working with Gradle. Some some tips that I will show you how to. Um, how to uh, get more of Gradle when you're using this. So yeah, welcome on board. All right, um, so I guess looking at this slide, probably many of you can relate to it. Uh, so this happens when you're working on a feature and you're writing lots of code and you're doing like layouts and stuff. And then you hit the run button and the wait begins. So wait for, for minutes or even more and you grab a coffee, you watch some kittens on YouTube and basically you lose your development pace. And this is really important because uh, it's really hard to get back to the pace that you had when you were developing. Um, and I think it's really important for us to invest time into improving the builds and to try to uh, cut down those waiting times. Um, and of course, as I said, uh, Gradle team is aware of um, some of the performance things, uh, performance problems with Gradle, and they document this quite well, all the new features. And there's a really nice resource that I can recommend. Um, it's called Improving the Performance of Gradle Builds. Uh, so just find it online, uh, read it. It's, it's very interesting and lots of cool tips in there. And of course, we will uh, speak about uh, some of them here. Um, so what do you do when you want to optimize your build? So luckily, there are a couple of quick improvements, um, just some small things that you can tweak into your build to make it faster. So first of all, always try to keep up with um, newest Gradle versions. Um, of course, when the performance improvements come, they come to the latest versions. So if you're not on, on the latest ones, you will just miss out of, on all that quick, uh, cool stuff. Um, so at the moment, there is Gradle 3.4.1 as the latest version. Uh, Gradle 3.5 is just around the corner. It should be around in no time, I guess. Uh, Gradle plugin is 2.3.1. Uh, the one is just like a small bug fix. So generally, if you use 2.3.0, you're also good. Um, yeah, so always, always try to update and stay up to date with the versions. Um, the second quick improvement is the Gradle daemon, which probably many of you uh, heard about. 
Um, so what is the daemon actually? Um, whenever you start a Gradle build, um, it has to first of all spawn a, uh, an instance of JVM because Gradle runs on, on the JVM. Um, and it also has to bootstrap it, load some dependencies, and of course it takes time. And if you do it for, all, for every build, then of course it will impact the performance. So daemon is actually a long-lived background process which has all that stuff already in memory, um, and multiple builds can just reuse all that stuff. So you save on that bootstrapping process. Um, so if you're on Gradle 3, then you don't have to do anything to use the daemon. You just, it's just enabled there by default for you. Uh, if you're still on Gradle 2, first of all, you have to update to Gradle 3. I really recommend it. But if for some reason you stay in there, uh, just add this line to the Gradle properties file to enable the daemon. Um, so one word of caution, uh, normally you would uh, disable um, daemon on CI environments, um, just because on CI you would uh, generally prefer correctness over performance. So it's not that critical if your uh, CI build is like five or 10 seconds slower than, than usual, uh, but if there is some shared state, sometimes it can affect the builds. Uh, so there's just general advice to maybe not use it on CI. Um, so to do this, you could either like place the false flag into the Gradle properties, maybe the one that, that lives on the, on the machine that, that runs the CI builds, or what you can also do is uh, to append the dash dash no daemon modifier uh, to the uh, build command. Um, and also if for some reason you want to stop um, daemons running on your development machines, you can use the dash dash stop command. It will just destroy all the daemons that, that run on the, on the machine. All right, so another quick improvement is the parallel execution. Um, it's kind of self-explanatory, so basically what it gives you is uh, the possibility to build um, sub-projects in parallel, so all the modules inside your build. Um, of course, it uh, highly depends on the structure of your project. So if you have lots of uh, small modules which are interdependent, then you will probably have lots of performance gains. Uh, if you have your modules kind of dependent on each other, maybe you will not see any improvements, but still it's uh, worth giving it a try. Um, so to enable it, you would just place um, the following line into the Gradle properties. Um, and also a word of caution. So um, if you go to the online doc that I showed you earlier, it, they describe this kind of cases in more detail, uh, but running some tasks uh, in parallel can lead to some unexpected results. So for example, if you're doing clean in parallel with some build actions, then sometimes it will just not work. But for more detail, just, just check the guide. But generally, it should work. Um, all right, so unfortunately, this is the end of the quick improvements uh, chapter. Uh, so for more, you, of course, have to know what goes wrong with the builds, what are the bottlenecks. And for this, you have quite a number of tools. Uh, so first of all, the built-in profiler. So every time you run a build, you can also append the dash dash profile um, command to it. And when you run the build, it will generate a pretty nice report for you, which is in HTML. And you can see that there's quite a lot of information here. First of all, uh, different build phases, starting from uh, the startup, uh, configuration, task execution, stuff like that. So you can really just dive into and see the timings for different build activities. Um, and, and yeah, see what, what goes wrong, what can be faster. Um, so another uh, tip for that, um, when you want to measure just the configuration phase and exclude all the task execution, you can uh, use the dry run modifier. Uh, this basically just tells Gradle to not execute any tasks. So it will just stop at the configuration phase and ignore all the execution. Um, so another cool feature um, that's available um, with Gradle is called the build scans. Uh, so build scans are also kind of profile reports, but they live on Gradle servers, and they can be accessible through the like build scan link. So you could share uh, the timings of the builds with, with your collaborators, with your team. Uh, so to enable build scans for your project, uh, you just use a um, separate Gradle plugin. It's pretty easy to, to install. Um, then you run the build, so you use the dash d scan command to, to enable a scan for the, the specific build. Uh, and at the end of it, you would, so Gradle would just print out the, the link. Uh, so when you access this link, it doesn't uh, uh, lead you straight to the build scan, but rather it will 
kind of lead you to some UI which asks you for, for your email, and when you introduce your email, it will actually send the link to your email, and then you can click it, and uh, you will see something like this. Um, so this is a quite, quite a detailed report about the build. Uh, it has all the timings, as I previously showed you, um, from the, like the built-in profiler, but it has more, so it has some um, like tips on enabling certain features to speed up the build. So it's, it's, it's really quite a lot of information and it's pretty useful. Uh, so one problem might be that uh, build scans are actually available to everybody who has the link. So if you're doing build scans for like your um, uh, corporate projects or whatever, then this might be like a problem. So you don't want to share this information with everybody. Uh, but generally, like if you're doing open source or, or like you don't have problems with like this information being available, then build scans is, is quite a nice tool. I can really recommend it. All right, um, so this is kind of the main part of it. Uh, then let's go to a part of, of some tips and tricks that I discovered during my um, experience with Gradle. Um, so first of all, speaking about plugins. So uh, definitely there are lots of um, cool plugins for Android development that can do various things for you, uh, but please use them wisely. So don't just use each and every plugin that you find online, or at least like give it a try and decide whether you have to keep it, you, you want to keep it, or you can you can drop it. Uh, just because every plugin, uh, of course, adds to the uh, to the build time, to the configuration phase specifically. So yeah, well, just just keep the stuff that you really use. Uh, don't use too much stuff because yeah, it it makes it um, uh, it makes it slow. Uh, there's also a pretty neat trick to um, to enable or disable certain plugins uh, on conditional basis. So you just can wrap the apply plugin statement with an if block, uh, and to enable it, you would just pass the the parameter from the command line. Uh, if you don't pass it, the plugin will not just just not be applied uh, to the build. So you don't pay this price for using this plugin if you don't really need to. Um, so the same goes for dependencies. Um, I think it goes without saying that unnecessary dependencies are bad, especially in Android where you have the dex method limit. Uh, so, and for Gradle, they, they also affect the dependency resolution time. So just um, kick out the dependencies you don't use and it will save you some, um, some time um, in, in this phase of the build. Um, there's also a note about the repositories. So try to keep uh, the repository count low, and also the ordering matters. So what Gradle actually does is that it will just iterate through the repositories and try to resolve uh, dependencies um, from the repos one by one. But if it, for example, encountered JSender and it could resolve like 90% of your dependencies from JSender, it will just try to resolve the rest from the other repos. So it's really important to keep like the biggest repos on top and then just go down. So uh, so just keep JSender there. If you have something different, then just place it uh, uh, below JSender. And also to the question about JSender versus Maven Central, so it just uh, it's just enough to have JSender because it's quite a uh, it's it's like a superset. So you don't need two of those. So just keep JSender there. Um, so another tip, uh, which is Android specific, um, it's about uh, build variants. Uh, so you know that there are build types uh, like debug and release and you can also add flavors and uh, in combination they create a matrix. So if you have two build types and you have two flavors then uh, in total you will have four build variants. Um, and some of them sometimes don't make sense. So for example here uh, I have uh, debug and release and I also have two flavors QI, uh, QA and live uh, for like different server uh, environments that, that my app is using. And of course, like release QA doesn't really make sense because my users should never contact my QA servers. Uh, so it's really easy to um, kick out this variant. Uh, so you just need to find it th uh, by iterating through all the, all the variants. Uh, and you just set the ignore flag to true. And it, this will tell Gradle to not consider this, this specific variant. Um, and this, of course, saves you like 25% of time because each variant gets like the dependencies get resolved for that specific variant, it builds the specific variant and so on. So this is quite a neat trick uh, to just remove unnecessary variants. All right, so this was mostly about uh, performance. Now let's jump to another chapter and discuss some of the tricks that I discovered that uh, can make your uh, productivity grow. So 
uh, your, make your experience with Gradle um, a little better. Um, so basically, um, I really think that Gradle files should be kept uh, with the same, um, so you should apply the same approach of keeping them clean as you do with, with your Java sources or Kotlin sources or whatever. So I, seen, I saw quite a lot of build Gradle files which are just serving as like a dump of whatever configuration that can be there, which are really long and unreadable, and this is not good. So uh, there are mechanisms that uh, make it easy for you to keep them small and, and import them, so this is all possible with Gradle. Um, so first trick that I really um, like and use it in every, product, every project um, is the way to, uh, to keep your dependencies. Um, so first of all, we need a separate Gradle file. Let's call it dependencies Gradle. Uh, and we could use um, a couple of maps to store different values. So first map will always be uh, versions. So here you see the, the keys for kind of different um, dependencies. And the value would be the, the dependency version. Um, so next map or a set of maps can be certain uh, already specific dependencies. Uh, so here you see those are all related to support libraries. Um, and also you can see that the dependency declaration line uh, references the version from the previous map. Uh, and you can already see a, a cool thing about it, that the, the version of support library is just mentioned once in this file. So whenever I need to change it, I will just change it in one single place. I don't need to change it in every declaration. Um, and then go into the actual built Gradle file. Um, I can use apply from to kind of import that file in and then just reference those declarations uh, really nicely. Um, and here also the win is that if you have multiple modules which use same dependencies, uh, then the declaration, so the referencing will look the same. And if for example on this slide you decide to, uh, to change something about certain dependency, you, again you just change it once, you just change it in a single file. So it really keeps your dependencies organized in a single file. When you change something, there's just one place you have to address. All right. Um, same goes for like um, specific configurations. So there are plugins which uh, ask you for like lots of boilerplate to configure them. Um, so I know for Jacoco, there's a quite a quite a nice uh, Android plugin for Jacoco. Uh, but I remember like at some point it was pretty hard to set up Jacoco for Android. So you had to like create tasks manually and so on. And I really remember like there was a lot of boilerplate that had to be put into the build files. Uh, and again, with this kind of problem, it's, it's easy to separate it out in a, into a separate file. Uh, again, we can call it Jacoco Gradle, just put all the boilerplate into it and apply from, into, from, from your uh, actual build Gradle file. So it's, it's really easy, it keeps it clean. Um, it's, it's really nice. Um, all right, so um, speaking about the, the tools, the, the stuff that, that Gradle has, um, I really think uh, knowing how command line Gradle works is, is important, even though uh, we're working with Android Studio uh, mostly, but sometimes uh, things happen that, um, a lot, that, that actually need you to, to get more information. And command line is a great interface to, to have more info, to get more info from Gradle. So for example, if, um, if the build fails, then in Android Studio you would generally just see some minimum amount of information. In, uh, often it's not clear what the problem is. So in this case, just switch to the command line, run your build from the command line, and you have uh, lots of tools to, to give you more info. Uh, so there are some modifiers to, um, to manage the output that Gradle gives. Uh, so first of all, it's, it's the dash S for, for the stack trace. So when your build fails, by default you would just see like a couple of lines. If you need the, the entire stack trace, just, just uh, put the dash S there and it will print out the entire stack trace. Also for the, um, for the logs, so there are certain log levels in Gradle. Uh, the default one is called quiet. Uh, this is what you generally see when you uh, run a Gradle build from command line. Um, there's the info log level, which will give you more output, so more information in the command line. And there's the debug log level, which is like really verbose. So there is every kind of stuff in there. So when you need to debug your build, then you would generally, most likely you will use info, there's enough information from it, but debug also kind of gives you all of it. Um, that's, that's pretty useful. Um, 
So another modifier is the dash dash offline, which it, what what it tells it uh, what what it tells to Gradle is basically to switch to to offline dependency resolution, so it will not go online to fetch the dependencies for your build. Uh, it will just rely on the local cache. Of course, the build will fail if you don't have the dependencies cached. Uh, but the the gain of it is that it will also kind of save you some build time because it doesn't go online. Um, so our kind of a counterpart to the previous one is the refresh dependencies. So we normally use it uh, on CI. Uh, what it will do is just re-download all the dependencies. So it's just like a measure to prevent kind of some uh, weird dependencies in, in, in the CI builds. So it can basically, um, yeah, well, it, it's, it's pretty useful to, to use it on CI to just re-download that stuff. Um, so sometimes there is a question of, like, you have a project, you have lots of dependencies, but you notice that there are some libraries that you don't know where they come from, like some um, some transitive dependencies that creep into your build and have, like give you some problems. So it's really easy with Gradle to know what exactly goes into your build. You would just use the dependencies task, or you have the Android dependencies task, which is specific to uh, Android kind of stuff, like support libraries. Um, and when you use this one, you will uh, see a pretty nice ASCII graph of all the dependencies that go uh, into your uh, final project. Um, and by exploring this graph, you, you can basically get information on the versions of artifacts that you're using and also where they come from. Uh, and you see there is like uh, lots of info here. For example, look at the, uh, there are some arrows in, in the at certain lines which means that, for example, if OKHttp 3.3.0 is referenced by, let's say, retrofit, but there is like a newer version of OKHttp which is referenced by another artifact, then Gradle will prefer the biggest version. This is like the default rule for dependency resolution. Um, also, you see those mysterious asterisks. I was kind of thinking, what, what do they mean? And I did some research on that, and it's just simply uh, pieces of graph that, that uh, Gradle just doesn't print twice. So those are some dependency, some like basically chunks of graph that are already printed. So if you see like the retrofit 210 with the asterisk, like the first line with asterisk, and you uh, take a look a little bit uh, to the top of it, you already see like this graph going from, from that version. So Gradle just doesn't print them twice for, for brevity. All right, um, there's another pretty cool task. Uh, related to dependencies, it's called dependency insight. Um, this allows you to get more info about a specific artifact, where it comes from, uh, where it's referenced. Um, it also results in a uh, ASCII graph, uh, and it shows you like where OKHttp is referenced in in what modules, and if it's a transitive dependency, then what artifact uh, drags it in. Um, all right. Um, um, now, kind of uh, a number of some random tricks and random features of, of Gradle. Um, so one thing that I find pretty useful and use it quite a lot is uh, called build config field. So what this allows you to do is to um, declare some fields, which in the end will get built uh, into a specific Java file called build config. Uh, and the, the gain is that you can um, provide different values for different uh, build variants. Uh, so, for example, a use case here is that, uh, say you're working on a feature where you have some time-dependent uh, time feature. Basically, the feature is time-dependent. So, say um, you want your app to update something once in 24 hours. And then you start to QA this feature, and you understand that like waiting for 24 hours is really not cool. Uh, and what you can do with it is you can introduce build config fields and just pass in a smaller value in a different build variant. And then just build it, and then you will only have to wait like 10 minutes uh, for, for this to kick in. Uh, and this is really transparent for your sources, so you don't have to change anything in your Java code. It's all done there by Gradle. Um, another really nice application of, of Gradle is related to, um, to this like very known problem of storing some uh, semi-secret values in, in the sources. So for example, you have some API keys. Uh, and the, the general advice uh, is against so storing them in Java because you don't want those to be exposed. 
So what you can do is actually store them locally on your machine. So you just place them in the, in the Gradle properties file, uh, the one that is not in the project folder, but the one is, which is in your home directory. So this is like home.gradle slash Gradle properties. Uh, then you can reference this key um, with a build config field and ultimately you could uh, reference this in, in your Java code. Um, so this kind of solves the problem of putting them under uh, version control. So this, this like secret value just lives on your development machine. It's not on the, uh, in, in the repository. Um, another uh, quite cool uh, thing that mm, I use um, is the REST configs uh, feature. It's, it's already like Android part, Android specific. What it does is that it uh, removes all the resources except the ones that you uh, define here. Uh, so for example, your app supports only English and German locales. So you don't localize for um, other languages. Uh, but there are some uh, libraries like AppCompat and the Google Play services uh, that have lots and lots of resources for all, all the types of uh, location, lo locales. Um, so you, you don't really need those because you don't uh, target uh, those languages. So to remove all that stuff, uh, to make your build smaller, you can just use REST configs. Uh, and also, um, you, you can use the auto instead of specifying locales manually. This will just analyze which uh, uh, localizations you have in your app and will just remove all the unnecessary stuff on top of it. Uh, so the last tip um, is, is a really useful one, again. Uh, so I found it in, in an article by Dan Liu. Uh, this is basically about sharing some code between different types of your tests. So say you have some test data uh, and you don't want to duplicate it uh, between your unit tests and your instrumentation tests. What you can do is create another source set, let's call it shared test, um, and you can define it basically in the source set uh, block and then add this source set, like this directory to, the, to both source sets for, for test and Android test. And this will be visible to both types of your tests uh, so you can reuse that code. All right, so this is my personal list. Of course, it's not exhaustive. Um, there are lots of lots of tips and tricks, and yeah, just look out for them, speed up your builds, and um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do with Gradle. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention, and.